I speak to you this day in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. In this uh, season, our second reading each Sunday, the one that we are often most likely to neglect, is from St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. Now, chopped into weekly bits, the letter does not make a whole lot of sense, but read in a sitting, as one would normally read any letter, it's a fascinating piece of writing. Paul has spent 18 months in Corinth, first preaching the new gospel of Jesus, then recruiting the church there, and finally establishing the structures of that church so that when Paul leaves, it can continue to flourish. But when he leaves, he's barely down the road toward his next stop when a rider catches up with Paul to tell him that back in Corinth, all hell has broken loose. And to understand this, we first need to understand Corinth itself. Corinth had been an ancient city, but when Rome conquered it, it scattered Corinth's inhabitants and leveled that old city so that it could build a brand new Corinth over the ruins of the old. Rome then transplanted people from all over the empire with promises of land and other incentives to populate the new Corinth. The result was a polyglot city that was something like a cross between Las Vegas and New Orleans during Mardi Gras. <laughs> Corinth was a glittering, anything goes, whatever happens in Corinth stays in Corinth kind of town. And even the newly converted Christians had trouble leaving their old habits behind. So what were the presenting issues that furtive rider shares with St. Paul on the road? Well, I'm gonna tell you, but you probably won't believe me. The first issue that Paul addresses is that a lay leader in the Corinthian church is having an affair with his own stepmother. Next, it turns out that the affluent church members, those who don't have to work all day at wage earning jobs, are showing up early for the evening Eucharist and sitting around getting drunk on the communion wine. And even further on in the letter, Paul castigates church members for arguing over whose spiritual gifts are greater. The healers, the prophets, those who can speak in tongues, etc. And the image we get is like school kids bickering on the playground about who is the coolest. It's that point in the letter that St. Paul calls all the Corinthians noisy gongs and clanging cymbals and so on. You can't make that stuff up. It's like a bad reality TV show. Now see why I keep trying to get you all to start studying the Bible? Paul's first letter to the Corinthians reads in many places like a parent saying, that thing you're doing, stop it. But in other places, Paul takes a step back and offers a theological diagnosis to the overall problem in Corinth. He recognizes that all of the Corinthians' foibles and errors and gross transgressions are actually symptomatic of something much deeper and much more pervasive. Once in chapter one of the letter, and then again today in chapter three, Paul poses the overarching question. And it's a question that pertains throughout the ages as much to us today as it did to the first century Corinth. Paul asks his readers, to whom do you belong? That's an interesting word, belong. Its etymology traces to two meanings, both of which are worth our notice. The first is from the Dutch, and it means to concern. In other words, we belong 
to that with which we are concerned. That makes perfect sense. That which occupies our thoughts, which populates our anxiety, on which we spend our time, our energy, our money, that which concerns us owns us in a sense. We belong to that with which we are concerned. The great 20th century theologian Paul Tillich took this notion to its logical end and said that our God is that with which we are ultimately concerned. And in that case, if we're honest, the God we claim to worship when we come here to church is not, by Tillich's measure, our true God. Now that's hard to hear and even harder to accept. But what Tillich forces us to confront is this. How much of our time outside of these walls... How much of our consideration when we make our daily decisions throughout our lives? How much of our interactions with other people are determined by our devotion to and our adoration of God? Not much, Paul Tillich would say. Most of us don't often pause to consider the God of grace as we tick through the moments of our day. And thus Tillich would say that God is not really our ultimate concern. Instead, our ultimate concerns are placed in many other things. Our ideologies, our politics, our finances, our biases, perhaps our addictions our petty grudges, and our legitimate personal worries. Some of these things are toxic and some are benign. But Tillich says that whichever of these things or whichever combination of these things preoccupies our thoughts and drives our decisions, those are our ultimate concerns. And thus, those are our God's. Those are the things to which we belong. St. Paul is saying the same thing to the Corinthians. To whom do you belong? Paul asks them throughout the letter. And judging by their behavior, they belong to any number of things. But they don't belong to Christ. Christ. Then that points to the second meaning of the word belong. It's from the Middle English, and it means to be fitting. In other words, we fit ourselves. We conform our thoughts and our actions and our decisions and our behavior to that to which we belong. If our ultimate concern is wealth, we act materialistically. If our ultimate concern is winning in business or in politics or in life, we become vicious. If our ultimate concern is a bottle, we will ignore all other responsibilities in order to get that drink. We fit our actions to that to which we belong. Paul's deep frustration with the Corinthians is that their actions are entirely unfitting to discipleship. The Corinthians claim to follow Jesus, but in their actual lives, they follow anything and everything but Jesus. And that's worth some introspection for us too. We may rebel against the notion that our gods are something other than God. Paul presents us with a way to check ourselves. How do we act? Do we fit ourselves to the ways of love and grace? Or do we, in Paul's words today, quote, behave according to human inclinations? 
and chase after other gods. Well, this past week, the Rector's Book Club met for the first time and we discussed C.S. Lewis's classic, The Great Divorce. Lewis's book is about heaven and hell. And his conclusion is that hell is the life lived with something other than God as its ultimate concern. Most of the characters in The Great Divorce who find themselves in hell, they don't even realize where they are. They're so consumed with concerns other than God. They so entirely fit their attitudes and their actions to those other concerns that though they are miserable, and they are all miserable, they fail to recognize why. Some seek to possess their spouses or their children as instruments of their own sense of worth and meaning. Some are obsessed with their own superiority. Others are obsessed with their victimhood. Some thrive on their arrogance and their indignation. Some are consumed by addiction. But in every instance, the characters belong to and fit their lives to something other than God. Heaven is constantly held out to each of them. And for those who ultimately enter heaven, the threshold is crossed when they say in essence, I will no longer fit myself to this other thing. I will no longer allow it to be my ultimate concern. I will no longer belong to it. I will belong to God. And then the world changes. Hell becomes heaven. God, as the new ultimate concern, becomes the prism through which all other concerns are viewed and considered. Grace becomes the milieu through which all else is encountered. And that then changes action. The characters in the story find that they begin to fit themselves to God. They begin to interact in ways that channel grace to others. Love itself becomes purer as all other loves in life flow first from their love for God. As in C.S. Lewis's fable, so it is in our real lives, in our very real world. St. Paul says to us, as St. Paul says to the Corinthians, you belong to God. Let go of all else. Allow God to be your ultimate concern. Fit yourself to God's grace. And then even the hells we encounter in this life, we will find transformed into heaven. Amen.